international policy. I tried. <laughs> Uh, so today we're going to be talking about U.S. foreign policy, America's Forever Wars. Um, obviously, if you'd like to learn more about our incredible speakers, their bios are in the app and there's a little description. But I did want to briefly, quickly share with you, um, historically, when we talk about foreign policy or immigration, we usually, the, the thinking is that these are issues that people don't normally vote on, right? The reality is that that thinking is outdated as we've seen this year. They're incredibly important issues and they're important issues particularly for the left. Now, we're gonna be talking with these incredible speakers. Each of us has extensive experience and lived experiences impacted directly by US foreign policy. I myself come to this conversation as an Iranian American with anti-war and foreign policy experience and as someone who has the privilege of being involved in the Afghan American community organizing with my colleague here. But what we're really gonna be talking about is how can the US end its involvement in war, uh, particularly for Gen Z, they've only really grown up with war as the backdrop. How can we really center robust diplomacy and reinvest in priorities at home? When we talk about US foreign policy, it's not just a list of problems, but the reality is with such a huge budget, it can also be the solution to a lot of other things if we reinvest and, and reappropriate the, the money. And then also talking about including welcoming refugees that are caused by uh, America's policies overseas. So you didn't come here for me. Uh, I wanna go ahead and let our wonderful speakers uh, share with us. But the first question, we have a few questions. We also want to make sure there's time for questions at the end. Our first question to the panel is, tell us what brought you into this work. Is there a par particular or defining experience that led you to focus on US foreign policy? And I think we're probably going to start with R.S. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mana, for moderating for uh, these amazing panels who uh, joined me here today. Um, for me, that uh, question I want to take us kind of back to uh, August of 2001, which is when my family moved to the U.S. I was 13 years old, and you know my first week in public school in Northern Virginia, you know September 11th happens, and still remains probably the most monumental day for myself, uh, because now I fast forward, uh, you know, you know in eighth grade I was dealing with Islamophobia, racism. Uh, really my first experience is white supremacy here in America, and I take us to August of 2021 uh, when, um, you know, America's foreign policy really became deeply personal to me because uh, it was myself and my community members and anybody who else who was allied with us and had maybe some kind of connection or a loved one uh, or somebody they worked together with in Afghanistan, um, you know, we were doing the job that uh, America failed to do, or was not willing to do and failed to do, or, and we were cleaning up America's foreign policy mess because we were trying to evacuate our friends, our family, uh, our community members uh, to the United States. Now, what did that look like for us? You know, so I was sitting in a room in Los Angeles. Uh, I was trying to charter planes, and I was making Excel spreadsheets with people and the passport numbers, and uh, I was talking to U.S. military personnel and the National Security Council and nonprofits. Uh, and basically, anybody would leverage any kind of pull, any kind of power in D.C. to say, hey, you know, check out, these, check out these refugees. Check out my list of queer and trans Afghans. Check out my list of Shia and Hazara Afghans. These need to be at the top of your list, uh, you know? And so um, that was kind of the catalyst for the start of our organization in 2021. Uh, but really, it was because uh, America, for not just for 20 years, you know, and set the context right also, um, you know, my, I'm a product of the Cold War. You know, I'm a, a, a child of Afghan refugees who fled in the 1980s because the United States was involved in a proxy war in Afghanistan. Uh, and so that history dates back decades. And so, um, you know, uh, the work that we do and that I try to do, and I, the reason why I do this work is because uh, it's, it's deeply, deeply personal and it comes from the heart. Um, yeah, I appreciate the question. You know, for me, I never actually, I never envisioned actually working on foreign policy, believe it or not. Um, my background as a Palestinian would suggest otherwise, but, you know, for me, uh, my upbringing really in the, in the deep south in Mississippi was really shaped by what we understood at the time was, you know, very deeply embedded racism, um, which a lot of the work I do today 
counters anti-Palestinian racism. Uh, but for me, deeply personally, uh, as Iraq was happening, as Afghanistan was happening, for my family and others in Mississippi and the South at the time, you know, we dealt with Katrina, Hurricane Katrina. And just when, you know, when we talk about the humanitarian situation in Gaza, for example, it's eerily similar on how the government couldn't even get us water, how the government even couldn't get us resources. And so for me, just thinking about my upbringing and just how everything came together uh, from post 9-11 till now, there were various steps along the way that made sense in hindsight, but at times growing up, I never envisioned, again, working in foreign policy, but you know, I'm very fortunate to have um, had the opportunity when I was a teenager to actually engage in the United Nations um, during the various processes, but one of the key ones was the sustainable development goal process uh, with the agenda 2030. And you know, for me, that moment kind of showed me the world uh, in real view, real view in real time. Uh, getting to engage with people from around the world who are either committed to similar kind of values or ideas or ideas for progress kind of also like pushed me in that direction. But you know, that was 10 years ago and I could have never imagined I, I'm at where I'm at now, um, sitting next to people like Nancy and, and Arash and, and Mona. But um, yeah, you know, one of the biggest things for me in terms of those experiences was also the fact that I'm both black and Palestinian, which is a very unique identity. And again, um, you know, as I was growing up, one of the key faces on my screen, uh, on cable news was Colin Powell, uh, Condoleezza Rice, uh, just the black faces of the U.S. government also sent the message for us, um, thank you, also sent the message for us where I was from in the South that, you know, regardless of what you were, you were also a representative of the U.S. government. And a lot of people where I grew up had very negative feelings <coughs> about, um, you know, our involvement in the war, um, 2001, 2003, and, and after. So, you know, those experiences kind of built up over time, but for me, yes, these experiences kind of led me to where I am now, and they kind of influenced my work on foreign policy today. So, um, so yeah. Thank you. Yes. And, uh, oh, thank you so much for having me, and it's uh, so humbling to be sitting alongside Arash and Mohammed, and it is like really a huge fan of both of you, and I respect so much the important work that you are doing. Um, my experience also started as Arash's, like around 2000, 2001. I wasn't 13 then, <laughs> but it was uh, sort of um, around the same time when I was doing work in international development, and it was also around the power relations of aid. Uh, I was working with um, international organizations and the UN and the World Bank. And uh, it's just like you cannot not see the corruption that is there. That is not the corruption just of my government, Egypt, but it's also the corruption of the system as a whole. Uh, just either by turning a blind eye or just actively participating is uh, what I would call more, uh, not a system, but this like a sort of legalized bribery. Uh, as I saw it. Um, this was my first introduction to like the, the world of foreign policy from a certain perspective. Soon after, particularly with my uh, experience with the World Bank, I mean, I realized like, the issue is not really that we need more money uh, for development of the country, we need political reform. And this is where I shifted towards working and focusing mainly on military corruption. Uh, that did not sit well with the Egyptian government. It wasn't really the vibe, but um, anyway, I was subjected to a lot of uh, threats and harassment. I took a sort of a turn doing my PhD, trying to take a safe haven on that, st trying to study like more deeply um, the power relations of aid. But then in 2011, uh, the revolution uh, in Egypt uh, happened and I just went back. I I was leading uh, Freedom House's office there, uh, but then I got caught up in this whole um, what is known as the foreign funding case that was between the U.S. and Egypt. Uh, it was about us for 43 uh, aid workers uh, got um, accused of uh, fomenting unrest in the country. And you know the whole playbook of authoritarian regimes. But it's just like one of the moments that I, I just like 
keep remembering every time I hear people getting surprised right now is like, it's like they are racist over here. It's just like, oh, they're not treating, I mean, Palestinian lives as other lives. It's like, for me, that's like, really? <laughs> Did you just get the notice? Because the first time I experienced it, like, immediately when we got, um, I mean, uh, charged in, in that case, we were 43, and there were 17 Americans and Europeans there. Uh, and just before we got um, on trial, uh, a week before that, uh, the Americans uh, paid a bail of $5 million to the Egyptian government and took out all the Americans out of Egypt. And we were left there to face everything, just standing in that cage on, on our own. Uh, and that was like the first, like not the first, but one of like the stark introductions for me is just like what is really meant by I mean, hypocritical and, and racist foreign policy. And it was like really ironic that I was heading Freedom House, which is an organization that promotes uh, democracy and freedom in the world, I mean, on behalf of the United States. Uh, but that really uh, was kind of, uh, the, whole, the whole trial I was uh, part of was um, a microcosm of everything that's wrong with foreign policy including the way the US, um, it debunked a lot of the theories out there that the US gives uh, security assistance to countries in order to have leverage, which they never used, uh, that the US is promoting democracy, whereas their way to get out of this is either selecting just the Americans, putting them out, or seven years later after a long fight in courts, that their way actually of getting all of us out of this case, again, like only the ones who were heading foreign organizations, is to actually push the Egyptian government to change the law so that we would be able to have an appeal. So it's just like it really, it's like the irony could not been, could have been more stark for me. And it's like along the way for the past 25 years, it's like seeing how and why US foreign policy is dysfunctional and how fixing it would change a lot in the world. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you so much for sharing. Now you talked about US foreign policy. What does a progressive US foreign policy mean to each of you? And anyone can start. Um, I think we need to start with what's not a progressive foreign policy, um, which in like, you know, for the work that I do and for the work that uh, our community cares about, it's not progressive to wage war, uh, period. Uh, you know, there's this large historical narrative about Afghanistan. It was the good war, Iraq was the bad war, like we should have just focused on Afghanistan and we should have just fought that war and won it. And, you know, like that's, that's just not really, um, I, I think that should be uh, dispelled and, and be done away with because the end result of American foreign policy and the war is what we see today. So it's not progressive to hand over a country of 38 million people to a brutal dictator dictatorial regime that has instil instilled gender apartheid in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is the only country in the world where girls above the sixth grade cannot receive any type of education. Um, in Afghanistan right now, women are being arrested on the streets. They're extremely brave, but they're being brutalized, sexually assaulted, raped in Afghan prisons by the Taliban. This is the regime that the United States brokered a deal with uh, in its own self-interest and its own national security interest. Uh, that's not progressive to me. It's not progressive uh, to me to have a foreign policy where I'm forced to go to San Diego County, go to the border, you know, look at a wall that was built with our taxpayer money where Afghans are standing, speaking in my native tongue, saying, I'm seeking asylum at the border. That's not progressive foreign policy to, to me. It's not progressive that in two weeks' time I have to go to New York City where in sh homeless shelters there's hundreds of Afghans who took that journey where they fly to Brazil from a third country, they walk, swim, and uh, make their way to, this, uh, to our southern border to seek asylum where they're then faced with uh, awful conditions prolonged ICE detentions because they are Afghan and Muslim and or. Uh, often these are folks who translated and stood by U.S. service members, you know, so veterans, and they still are 
you know? So a few days ago, they were allies, and today they're in ICE detention. And so that, all of that is not progressive uh, foreign policy to me. And to also like, realize the connections between uh, what is happening when we wage war or fund uh, foreign uh, countries to, to wage wars against majority Muslim populations in countries like Afghanistan or, or elsewhere. Um, and, and to just, like, really see that connection with our immigration policy right now. But because we were seeing right now, there's a consensus on waging war bipartisan. We are seeing a consensus on immigration bipartisan that we should wage war. And then when we cause people to seek asylum at our southern border or elsewhere, we're going to close the door on them and we're going to actually detain these people and, and, and treat them really awfully, uh, which is what's happening uh, uh, to our community. So that, you know, I think we have to kind of maybe, maybe start there. Uh, but really, it's about centering um, uh, the people who are, who are impacted. And I think, you know, this is my first time in Netroots, but in the past I've seen. I see a very domestic uh, f focused uh, agenda, and I'm heartened to see that that's maybe changing. Uh, but I think you know there has to be a realization. You know, when we talk about these, like when we're talking about like protecting democracy, well, a democracy for who? Um, and because um, in, in countries like Afghanistan uh, and what Afghan Americans have been facing for the past three or three or four years, none, none of that has felt like we are being AA, being heard in this country, uh, or like we are being centered. But I think people largely should realize that America is not just oper operating in, in the United States. Uh, when it comes to the immigration policy, for example, uh, you know, the, the current administration is cutting deals with Mexico and ex basically, metaphorically, extending its border to Mexico, to parts of Mexico, to, Panam uh, to Panama, and all these Southern American and, and Latin uh, countries. Uh, and so America's operating in many corners and crevices and parts of the world. And so when we talk about progressive foreign policy, I think, I think that's where we have to start before we th start thinking about uh, maybe some of the other things uh, that, that would make and create an actual progressive uh, foreign policy. Yeah, you know, for me, progressive foreign policy is, I think in simplest terms, ideally it's supposed to be a clear articulation of progressive values, global. And, you know, there's, for those who study U.S. history, there was a progressive movement between 1890 and 1920 that tried to do this, uh, to create a progressive foreign policy that was a, uh, was a broadening of domestic priorities, you know, economic focusing on economic situations here, focusing on labor situations. But, you know, honestly, now that I think about it in real time, I don't feel like progressive foreign policy is as adequate as we try to make it be. And I say that with the backdrop of the last nine months. Um, we've seen a complete separation of progressives and progressive concept for Palestine. And ideally, foreign policy in the progressive sense should not have a disconnect between one area of the world and the rest of the world, and also communities here and communities abroad. Unfortunately, those who, you know, for me, I, I'm, I'm very much in the camp of progressive foreign policy should be, you know, the connection between domestic global priorities, but also building up institutions, strong, credible institutions, pushing back on fascist and, and autocratic regimes, um, essentially an alternative of you know, the decades of uh, kind of subjugation that people have been forced to endure under these brutal institutions, brutal infrastructure and stuff like that. Ideally, like, not to get too technical here, but, you know, when we talk about foreign policy, it's often caught up at the highest levels. There's often a big barrier of entry for who does for foreign policy to begin with. Progressive foreign policy for me, and I know for a lot of people on the panel, or all the people on the panel and a lot of people here in the room, you know, there should not be a barrier of entry for people who want to focus on global issues, right? Like, for example, Arash just mentioned the situation with Afghan refugees. There was a whole process trying to get Afghans here to the country under what's called special immigrant visas. And again, they've been left short. The same way that Palestinian American family members in Gaza have been left short, and now people are trying to fight for what's called a P2 designation. So, honestly, there's been this weird separation between domestic priorities, where our communities are directly affected, and global issues, and there's been silos. So honestly, progressive foreign policy, if you want to be honest with ourselves, is removing these silos, removing the walls, and creating bridges that actually are informed by international solidarity efforts, 
informed by local history, not by U.S. hegemony, not by what the U.S. beliefs of the world, but, you know, what do people in the Philippines actually feel about their situation? Where are the legacies of the Koreans who were occupied by the Japanese? Where are the legacies of these people in our, in our dialogue? And honestly, that's what I think is really missing. And that's what foreign, progressive foreign policy tries to do, trying to build those bridges, and it also tries to include the histories and the traumas and the legacies of people that have often been the targets of U.S. foreign policy. Thanks, Muhammad. Well, I fully agree with everything that Arash and, and Muhammad said. And I mean, we're hearing a lot these days, I mean, with the debate and conversation around Biden's presidency, and people say it's like, yeah, I mean, it's like we understand, I mean, the anger of people about his foreign policy, but he was really good on domestic affairs. I mean, that, that doesn't work. It's, you're either progressive or you're not. You're either sticking to your principles everywhere or you're not. Not just because of values, because it doesn't work otherwise. You can't imagine, for example, coming to say, like, but he really had good uh, climate policy domestically, but internationally not. <laughs> it's not. It's like, are you, is there, you're damaging the, the, the environment and taking the, the climate uh, to a dangerous level, or you're not. And the same thing with human beings. I mean, so a progressive foreign policy starts as like it's human security is at the heart and the core of it. And the progressive foreign policy is also is based on solidarity that you cannot imagine, or also, again, this is like completely, I mean, uh, sort of in terms of practicality. I mean, there will be no national security without global security. That's, that's a given. But again, it's like the reason why, I mean, as we see that U.S. Uh, foreign policy is dysfunctional, to say the least, if not harmful uh, at some points, as we are seeing right now, um, it is because there are a set of like problematic structural and, um, and framing issues of U.S. foreign policy that is driving what is the U.S., how the U.S. is dealing with the rest of the world. I mean, it's like a really, I mean, cannot be more lucky to be working at the Center for International Policy because we are determined that there needs to be a shift in U.S. foreign policy. And maybe I, I, I sound like a broken record, but we just like have this 5R uh, strategy for change that really deals with everything that's strong with U.S. foreign policy. And one of them is like the first R is like redrawing uh, the stakeholders map. I mean, like, who sits on the table when people are deciding on foreign policy? Whose views are included? Whose voices are heard? I mean, like, in the past panel, is like hearing Rebecca Lushdi talking about, is like, how the only Palestinian member of Congress, Rashida Tlaib, was like the one who was censured. I mean, that, that says a lot. When the only person who represent uh, a, <laughs> an entire population that the U.S. is involved in, directly is the only one who get reprimanded. It says a lot. So I think it's just like a progressive foreign policy should certainly work on redrawing the stakeholders map, who gets to be included. And the second thing is redefining security. And the idea of looking at security from the narrow lens of uh, arms and military might, I and mean, you just like, it's, it's not only obsolete and harmful, it's also dysfunctional. And understanding that security includes everything, and includes it's like issues related to health, uh, equality, uh, racism, anything that really creates a reason or a root for a problem that creates conflict should be the priority of what defines um, um, what defines what security is. And also the second thing is like the other thing is like redefining how we view geopolitics. I mean, just going about like U.S. foreign policy from the perspective of great power competition is is one of the most dangerous approaches I've seen. It's just like it, it is driving everything. It's driving the policy of the U.S. everywhere, including in the Middle East uh, that we're having. And also the second thing, the idea of that you can partner with countries that are authoritarian or uh, just like and, and corrupt on issues that are not related to human rights and you think that this is going to be productive is, is a myth. Like what we are seeing right now with the U.S.-Saudi defense deal that the 
United States is trying to push for, like dubbed as like Saudi um, uh, Israel normalization, just like that needs to change and progressive foreign policy cannot be supportive of something like that. It's like the most important part of it is like reviving accountability. It's like in, also in the past panel on other panels, it's like we see it's like why we keep hearing about this. And it's just like these things are reoccurring. Why are we seeing people who were part of the Iraq invasion are today like respectable people that are listened to in current foreign policy? Why, as Arash always says, is like that the the Afghan issue. I mean, then the crisis did not end in 2021. It actually started even there. But why is it continuing that way? Because there was no accountability. It's just water under the bridge, and the people who were party to it have been have not been held accountable. And, and so long as we can carry on with any policy, whether domestic or foreign, without accountability, then people will have no cost for their injustice. And it's like one of the things that I really admire was the work of many people who are continuing to struggle and, 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 and lead the, the movement for, for what's happening in Gaza and Palestine is like, and some people is just like have the argument is like, we will never defeat the Israeli government. When some would say it's like, well, at least we make the occupation costly for them. And that could change things. So without accountability, the changing of hearts and minds, I mean, would get people to sympathize, but would not re really read really like a, to a fundamental change of it. Thank you. For my next question, in some communities, there's a clear distinction, and, and this is something I've experienced, between the experience in one's homeland versus living in the diaspora, particularly in the United States. Does that come up in your work and identity? And if so, how do you identify and grapple with that distinction? Yeah, I, if I could. Um, yeah, so I, I work at the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights. And obviously, we're a Palestinian-led organization uh, based in the United States, which in and of itself is a very unique thing. Um, you know, Palestinians for decades have been the, one of the largest, I believe, like global or globally stateless populations. And inherently because of the challenge, it's like we have to deal with the fact that a lot of our people are in the diaspora, but a lot of our people are still in the homeland. And, you know, for people in Gaza, a lot of people never had the chance to leave Gaza, even before October. Um, but the fact that, you know, we have to reckon with the fact that there are people under occupation, there are people. Uh, under a military blockade in Gaza, that's total air land and sea, um, compounded by U.S. foreign policy and compounded by continual investments in the security apparatus. Um, you know, it is challenging because, you know, you have people that are viewed as credible, voices to speak on issues, versus people that are inherently deemed not credible. You have people that are often deemed as the good Palestinians, the rich Palestinians, or the people that are, you know, X, Y, and Z type of dynamic. You also have a situation where there's a disconnect between people who've never experienced occupation and people who have. And because we are all spread out over the world, people, whether they be government or businesses or whatever, can choose sometimes people in the diaspora. And I'm sure other communities deal with this as well, but what you see is often like people at times feel like they're not being heard or they're not being championed or they're not being supported. But there's a weird dichotomy in every community. I, I remember uh, working in DC and seeing communities being torn apart because there was a disconnect between homeland and diaspora. But for a lot of people in the diaspora, there is an attempt to rebuild their homeland in the diaspora. And you know, so there's all these unique dynamics. But you know, for us as Palestinians, this is an ever an everlasting challenge until we're all able to return to our homeland. Uh, but in the time being, like there's these are things that we all have to reckon with and. Unfortunately, you know, it's challenging, but at USCPR, what we try to do is continue to make sure that Palestinians are, have what they need to be vocal, regardless of where they are in the US, and also make sure that our partners in the international solidarity movement know that we're active and vocal. But, you know, it's on all of us in the diaspora, regardless of where you are, to make sure that you're continuing to do whatever you can to reinforce people in your homeland are supported, and that they are the voice that you platform. So that's what we always do. We, uplift Palestinian civil society, 
people in Gaza, people in the West Bank, people under uh, in 1948 Palestine, uh, in our in our homeland. So, um, and that's also challenging too. I, I will just close here that you know Palestinians are also around Palestine. They're in Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Kuwait, in the Gulf, uh, surrounding, and even still, regardless of how close they are to their homeland, they still technically cannot return. So, you know, until return and until liberation, unfortunately. There is going to be this unique uh, distinction between homeland and diaspora, but for those of us that are committed to the work, you know, uh, this is just something that shows up, but it's a challenge. Uh, and I don't want to be like uh, optimistic and say it's not a thing, but for us, it, it certainly is. And I'll just say this too: uh, being a Black Palestinian is also unique. Um, you know, I come from the legacy of enslaved people. Uh, my grandfather's family and his, that whole generation of my family were sharecroppers and. They have no understanding of what it means to have a homeland. Their homeland are the plantations and the fields of rural Mississippi. So also when we think about the black experience here in America, um, or the United States of America rather, um, that's also something that's pretty unique too. Just the concept of homeland and diaspora, that doesn't exist for a lot of us. And homeland technically would be Africa, but still a lot of us don't know our lineage because the courthouses were burnt down or our records were destroyed or what have you, but, you know, just looking at the differences between the Palestinian experience and the Black American experience, the homeland and diaspora versus no homeland and probably no diaspora, it's something that's really challenging, but something that, again, we reckon with in our work at USCCR, but something that has been a reckon with, reckoning in our community for as long as we've been this place, but, um, but yeah. Um, yeah, I think that the experience that I've come across is that um, I, I just, I, I was, I was like my family first moved to the Netherlands and then came to the United States. Uh, so like, it's, that's just a weird journey to be on personally for, for, for my family. But I think I have an extra obligation versus folks, um, um, you know, who are, actually born and raised in Afghanistan and then who are forcibly displaced and exiled. And um, yeah, you know, like, um, I think, you, you know, in the past few years, people have used uh, these divisions. I think division in communities and diaspora immigrant uh, communities, communities of color is actually normal. Natural tension should exist. We should be disagreeing. We should be having conversations. We should be having discussions. Um, I would like to have those behind closed doors because there's right, especially right-wing forces that uh, really jump on these divisions and, um, you know, um, they, they, they try to divide and conquer us, you know, and so there's like really harmful policies that are implemented on the federal level, for example, against 38 million people who can't leave, who can't, uh, you know, flee to, to another country. Uh, who can give their girls education in, in somewhere else besides Afghanistan, maybe in the United States. And, you know, they, um, when they divide and conquer, they team up with uh, members of our community to say we should enforce more harmful sanctions that's, that's going to uh, kill millions of people. We're going to continue to, uh, uh, you know, freeze assets of the Afghan people that belongs to them. Um, and so uh, that's kind of my approach. Like, let's disagree and let's talk. Those divisions uh, are real, but I do think, so, you know, anybody that's, um, um, part of the diaspora and immigrant community, maybe second generation, has like an extra obligation to build a bridge with people um, that are displaced. In our work, for example, in, the, in New York, we host events with people, like I mentioned earlier, who are sitting in homeless shelters, and then they come to our event, and they, you know, they start giving me tips about the, how to run my event, which is great. And I'm like, then I dig a little deeper. They're like, yo, you know, well, I led four nonprofits in Afghanistan. I, you know, led a campaign and I, you know, I hosted uh, 127 events in 38 provinces. And I was like, you know, maybe, maybe you're more suited than you have actually, like, these are the type of people that are fleeing Afghanistan and coming to the United States, you know? And so I think we have an extra obligation to, to, to build those bridges with other members of our diaspora community. Um, <coughs> well, I Again, like even listening to what Arash was just saying, what he just described by saying that he is like, yeah, I ran organizations before and I've led is like, this is striving for legitimacy, right? Because whatever happens in the homeland in terms of differences between the people within the country is multiplied a thousand times when it is in, in the in diaspora or in, we're speaking here in the United States is like DC, Washington DC, I see it is just like sort of a 
a mirror of what's happening outside, but it's a distorted mirror, which is like the fun house mirrors that is just like really deformed in a way, and it is deformed, and it's the only thing that is not fun, and it's not funny, because it is, it becomes uh, an issue of survival, because particularly at the beginning of the movement, you move to a country, and then the question is like, who really represents the Afghan? Who really is speaking on behalf of the Iranian woman? Uh, and the same I, that I saw with everything, so the situation itself dictates that people would be more competing rather than collaborating. The structure of the way DC works and the structure of funding uh, organizations work put them even more into further into this situation where everyone is trying to prove that they're the ones who can actually speak and liaise and, and move. And it becomes, your identity becomes your job. And it's so difficult. What makes it even more acute that is very tenuous, I mean, there's this, just like this small window of opportunity when the world is paying attention to you because you're a threat, not anything else, particularly when it comes to us in the Middle East. So it was like, at times, it was like the, the Syrian refugees. Everyone is running to see how can we help, what can we do, and we want to host a Syrian, how can we create? It's just like, and all of a sudden, this all got erased. I mean, people only don't even remember the images or, or the names of the people. Then the Afghan, I mean, uh, 2021, I mean, the withdrawal from the, uh, the US withdrawal happened and it's like the crisis that happened afterwards. I mean, again, like made this like, what can we do? And this is the main, most important thing. It was just like I was having a meeting is like um, with NATO members in um, the fall of 2021. And I think this is the most important thing we're gonna work on for the rest <laughs> of the coming years. But then we have the invasion of Ukraine and so on, and, and then Palestine, it's just like this um, idea of like what is now uh, important and sexy in DC that is being also reflected in the media. This is, this is what gives the attention to people, and this is why people are really driven to be competitive, to be, and, and it creates, I mean, like as Mana, we were talking, it creates a very toxic environment within the communities that are abroad. And then there's also the question of like, who are you to speak on our behalf or say something? We are here, we're the ones who are fighting on the grounds. It's like, don't create glory over our blood. I mean, I've seen this and heard it in so many versions of it uh, over time. Uh, and I think, I mean, just like this is also in, again, is founded in the issue of like when, when we reach a point that we are competing over misery, uh, who's more I mean, in danger and at what time and, and what matters. And, and that's a reflection of a foreign policy that is not progressive because it doesn't treat people equally. Mm -hmm. It only gives them attention when that attention means votes or means a threat. And this is what we try to, to change actually is like one of the things that we're working on is like, yes, I mean, it's, it's horrible and catastrophic what's happening in, in Palestine, in Gaza. Also at the same time, there's like a similar catastrophe that is happening in Sudan. And the US is also involved, I mean, indirectly by arming countries that are arming some at uh, the proxy war over there. So I think it is, it goes back to the whole idea of the there is no national security without global security and there are no, you can't pick this region today and the other one tomorrow. I mean, it, it does not work that way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so hopefully some of you all have experienced this. Some in the left have a tendency, or actually unfortunately some of you all have experienced this, some in the left have a tendency to frame the US empire as bad and any force or power opposing it as good. For our particular communities, this can show up differently. What are your thoughts on this dichotomy? I, yeah, I mean, I would say if you show up to my community saying, um, U.S. empire bad and Taliban is good. I mean, I think you can imagine how people will, will, will feel about that. There's 150,000 people who have come in the past three years who have fled that exact, you know, political, humanitarian, and otherwise just awful situation. Um, and I would just say, you know, like, as Afghans or African Americans, as, you know, we are assisting hundreds of folks who have newly arrived, who are refugees, parolees, 
um, asylum seekers, et cetera, refugees, you know, um, I, I think they're just faced, they're stuck in this position where on the one side they are fleeing this really awful situation in Afghanistan that the U.S. is partially uh, is causing or has caused in the, in the past due to a variety of uh, policy decisions on foreign policy over the past 40 years. You know, um, and then they come to the U.S. and like I think the best example is what what we see on our southern border, uh, which is people are following the law. They have a right to seek asylum at our border, and they are just faced with prolonged detention, Islamophobia, um, and just deep de deep mistreatment. So like you know, there's just nowhere in the world where it's uh, okay or safe. Uh, or where an Afghan can find refuge, and, and so I think I think people should just always for uh, for our for our community, people should really take that in con consideration uh, that they face this like really awful situation at home in Afghanistan, and once they come here, uh, they face uh, you know uh, even for those folks, for example, who are evacuated here through that there are planes that are leaving every week, you know, that are coming to the United States that the U.S. is. This is, this is the U.S. government that is, that is doing this. And once they come here, they face all these horrendous policies, a housing crisis, a lack of affordable uh, health care, uh, no, uh, you know, kind of like uh, no uh, certainty about legal status. So, you know, folks that <laughs> do, get, do get on that plane, they have, no, uh, they have no idea whether they can stay in this country permanently due to the dysfunction um, and structural white support supremacy and racism that happens in, in our, our Congress because it's a piece of legislation called the Afghan Adjustment Act, which, which still uh, hasn't passed. So our community is just kind of always stuck between uh, you know, like a rock and a hard place or just two bad actors, it feels like, you know, and that's a, um, it's not a great um, uh, place to be. And we try to balance that uh, in our work and our advocacy and our, our organizing. Yeah, I mean, it's such a unique thing, to be honest, and I don't want to speak on behalf of the Palestinian community, obviously, but I, what I will say is that in other communities that I've seen personally, um, there's been a weird acceptance of imperialism by others, but anti-imperialism against the U.S. And I say that because after Ukraine happened, we saw a subtle embrace by people to say, okay, U.S. imperialism is bad, but then you saw some, some people say, okay, but... Russia, Russian imperialism is not that bad, and Chinese imperialism is not bad, but that same imperialism is why Palestine is occupied. And, you know, so I, I for me, I, I just want us all to take a step back and just say, like, you know, racism is bad. It's not, it's not you know, imperialism is bad. It, it's not who does it that makes it bad. It's the structure itself that makes it bad. And, you know, honestly, like, it's been a disappointment to see some people for example, be a Saudist, but want a free Palestine, like, or to be pro-Putin or pro-name any other authoritarian, fascist, totalitarian. Unfortunately, these contradictions exist, but I do think it's because there's a, there's just a subtle uh, misunderstanding or misdef mis misdefinition of uh, some of these institutions and some of these structures, unfortunately, but... It doesn't show up everywhere, but when it does show up, it's pretty obvious and it's noticeable. But to be honest, like in America, I think the closest thing for us all to understand is like being that anti-racist. And I just want us all to commit to like opposing structures, institutions, apparatuses, whatever noun or whatever you want to put on it. Um, if it's bad here, it's bad there. It's not going to help people anywhere. And um, I just want us to again be very clear on like where we where that line is and where we stand. Because uh, as you mentioned, it was the U.S. that is actually responsible. We all, the U.S. always says, oh, we don't negotiate with terrorists, but went to the UAE or Qatar and signed that deal with literal. So like, yeah, I, I just wanted to like be clear on like where we are. Um, and communities also need to make sure they're clear on where they are too. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, just, the, there, there's this 
rising in it's, it has always been there this false binary between uh, anti-imperialism and anti-authoritarianism and people think I mean like we have to just like turn a blind eye I mean, like against like for atrocities that are committed by countries that are being I mean in an adversarial positions with the United States for example I mean and and, and the problem is, is like the the choice should not be between one government over the other its choice should be between empowering civil society over governments, regardless of which governments those are. And the idea also, I mean, there's, I mean, of course, I mean, like there are corrupt leaders, of course there are leaders that are authoritarian and it just like pushes and, and, and promotes dictatorship and, and, uh, and repression everywhere. However, that does not come from thin air. I mean, th this kind of violence and repression is a reflection of lack of power and lack of ability to deliver. Governments who are not able to deliver to their people are, are governments who resort to violence to silence people because if they are have if they have the legitimacy and they are delivering, we they would not need to go through that. And this is not a justification, but to understand, for example, I mean, like why a leader like Ortega in, in, in Nicaragua, who started off as a, like a, the resistance movement, turned out to, do, to be this like fascist dictator just shooting people in the street. It's not that he had a, like a split personality <laughs> disorder. It is the being in power in a system that is corrupt. Again, like this is not a justification of uh, what he is doing or his deeds, but the, it, an understanding of the roots of the problem that is, is like unequal structural relations and power configurations in, in the world today. And to think that there are governments or power are better than others is such a naive idea because there are, I mean, tech companies today, their budgets are much higher than several European countries combined. And they have more power to inflict damage in the world, more than entire countries with their armies. So the idea is like we're focusing is like if just like we the U.S. would just like have less hegemony and and other countries would organically rise to be nice and what we call right now I means like casually as the global south as if also it's one thing. It's just like it's such a naive and distorted idea of the world and that this is why we end up with, I mean, dysfunctional and distorted policies that does not really solve the problem, but just like push it to the other side. Yeah. I, I just wanted to add, um, the last few months I've noticed uh, folks sharing things from the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, as, as an idea of like that's resistance because of what's going on in Palestine. And it's really been appalling for me because you're sharing from a government that is imprisoning and killing young people in its own country and is playing this whole propaganda game. Um, so again, it's really important for us, uh, particularly when we're talking about communities that barely get any visibility, to make sure when we do give visibility, we don't do it in irresponsible ways that are actually harmful, again, to those voices that are barely getting out of these countries or places. Um, so that was my little spiel as an Iranian American. I had to add that. Uh, otherwise, I'd get the comments after this panel. <laughs> Um, but my last question for you all is, with the resurgence in global fascism, it's very easy to be pessimistic. That's where I live. How is the wave of fascism affecting your work, and what gives you hope? Um, yeah, my, the, the work that I do is very depressing. Um, and... You know, I, I, yeah, people, like, you know, we, we were working with really amazing people. Uh, I, I've been trying to tell their stories today. Um, but, you know, as somebody who consumes the news and, like, many of uh, you are just always on their phone um, and getting, you know, getting pretty depressed about it, I, I, I work with people who really made, I mean, they, these folks are taking really dangerous and arduous journeys to come to the United States, you know, uh, almost dying, uh, drowning, uh, like going through the most dangerous uh, parts of the world, the Darien Gap in, in Panama, and once they come here, uh, they are just they they are just so hopeful, and they you know they enter the United States and they're living in a homeless shelter with no authorization to work, 
Uh, they're, to me, their future does not look that bright, but they are so optimistic, they are so hopeful, because their kids can go to school, uh, because they are not under the immediate threat of being killed, harassed, targeted, detained, uh, you know, killed. Uh, because of you know their job, because they were like a, a, a prosecutor under the former government, or because they had some ties to the U.S. mission or the U.S. military, uh, they just have that uh, uh, discipline of hope and optimism that is really, really infectious. It's the best part about uh, doing the work that I do. Uh, so even when I look down on my phone, I get depressed. Get depressed, but when I work with uh, our newest community members. Uh, and, you know, they have worries and anxieties, but um, they know, for example, that um, you know their kids hopefully, hopefully, will have bright futures in this country. And um, I mean, that that's that's like the fuel uh, for how I stay optimistic. And I hope uh, people take that with them because, um, yeah, sometimes I try to instill some anxiety in them, but they they really, you know, they really. <laughs> They really hang on to this really strong thread of optimism. It's really a kind of amazing thing to, to see. So I, I wanted to share that with folks because, uh, yeah, that's, that's what keeps me going. Is it rude to ask you if you have a plan as a Palestinian? I mean, yeah, I, there's a lot going in my head right now. Um, the question is also very timely. Uh, you know, you know, fascism is not something that just comes and goes. It, it's always here, and I know a lot of people are, have been framing, you know, the rise to, or resurgence of fascism now as it's a threat that we have to deal with. And November is coming up, and it's going to happen because of November. But you know, where I'm from in the South in Mississippi, fascism has always been around, and you know, we talk about, for example, the hysterectomies that you know people like Fannie Lou Hamer had. Uh, these fascist policies of separation, uh, of segregation, of just one party, one person, control and control, uh, enslavement, all these things. Um, you know, also with the rise of and, and rise and fall of certain people, you have Maloney in Italy, but you also have Tate Reeves in Mississippi. You have, you know, all these leaders that share a common thread of fascist ideologies. And, you know, for us, the work where it shows up the most for, for us at USCPR is actually repression. Um, right now, there are several Republicans on the Hill uh, from Florida, Texas, other places that are naming our groups intentionally in order to get information about our group, build up discovery cases for if, if a Republican administration happens to bring all our organizations down to create these falsified and fake uh, connections between entities that don't exist. And, you know, what you have is congressional efforts, the same efforts that uh, targeted encampments of students who simply protested their institution to divest from genocide and divest from Israel. Uh, you have students like NSJP, you have groups like American Muslims for Palestine, you have all these groups that are being targeted for simply just speaking up. And I think that's really the brunt of the resurgence of fascism. Uh, it's limiting who is allowed to speak, who, uh, who is allowed to act. And, you know, it shows up in a lot of different ways. Like, um, I'm sure I don't have to remind people what happened with the Muslim ban. Uh, the Muslim ban was not just people uh, being deported or being sent back to their country or people not coming in. That list was actually created because Trump had a list of countries, or rather Stephen Miller, had a list of countries that they were going to target specifically because of you know, these ideas that, you know, these countries are inherently evil, dangerous, bad people are coming from these countries. And, you know, it's, it's honestly just, we're seeing a lot of the recreation of the same things here. And I, I don't want to go on a random ramble here, but, you know, the resurgence of fascism, I think we need to be very clear and honest about. Uh, and, and I'll just end here. Uh, my honest opinion is that, is that I feel that we are in a uh, cyclical kind of time loop here. If you look directly about where we were about 100 years ago, the end of World War I, the reconstruction of Europe, there was a man who came on the rise, and I'm not talking about the German individual. I'm talking about a man named Mussolini, who in 1930, with an Italian counterpart, wrote something called the Doctrine of Fascism. Well, if you look at around the time they developed that, 100 years later today, there's something called Project 2025, which is a direct correlation between the articulation of fascist ideas, but a roadmap of how they want to institute 
a fashion society. And for us at USCPR, you know, Project 2025 targets Palestinians, it targets our communities, it targets everybody. And for us, you know, we've continued, regardless of who gets elected or regardless of who, whatever happens in November, we're very clear on what our community needs. We're also very clear on what fascism is. And again, as I said earlier, we just need to be very clear on what things mean, what they are. But again, fascism is not a threat. Fascism is not something that we have to worry about later down the line. Fascism happened a couple of weeks ago with the Supreme Court case that gave Trump immunity. Fascism is uh, banning abortion in state. Fascism is banning bail funds in Georgia, where you can only ban, where you can only bail out a person twice a year now instead of every time they get arrested. Fascism has is one of the foundational cornerstones of American society, along with anti-blackness, anti-Palestinian racism, and 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 other uh, kind of issues. But you know, I'll wrap here and I'll just say before I pass it to Nancy that you know I I do think we should be not just looking at the past, but looking towards the future. I don't want us to get caught in a loop again with saying, okay, fascism, fascism is inherently European, it's inherently Italian movement. No, this is a global phenomenon, something that continues to happen, and things that are rooted right in our communities, and we need to activate our communities. Communities need to know, they should have known about Project 2025 when it was created in 2023, but unfortunately, you know, Democrats had other ideas, but for us, USCPR, you know, we're continuing to push, we're continuing to work with our partners, whether that be Afghan or whether that be the, the institution like the IP. Um, but we're very committed and we know what we need to do. Uh, it just, it's just gonna take all of us to be together and united in order to actually push back against fascism. Because again, November is gonna happen and people think, okay, there's no more return to fascism, but that's not how political ideologies work. Look at what's happening with Zionism. And I'll just wrap it up. Thanks, Muhammad. Well, it's humbling to see you. It's like how you're talking about hope given everything. And um, I think if we're thinking about hope, one thing to begin with is that the era of long standing stability and stagnation is over. Like the rigid structure, and it does not mean it's something better, but it's changing. Uh, and the era of like predictable results of elections, we, we just like, again, like a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to someone, it's like, what's gonna happen in Europe when Marine Le Pen is going to be the president of France? And it was like, and all of a sudden, it was like, we see like a surprise out there. So the idea of like the guaranteed predictability, the kind of powerful is there, I think it's over. The movement is there and this is our moment. When things are shaken, not as like where all the furniture are stacked in a certain way that you can't movement. I mean, yes, it takes a crisis, it takes hundreds of thousands of people dying, and I'm not saying that this is like a legitimate collateral damage for a change, but if it's there, we should do something about it. And also at the same time, I mean, was, uh, I like how um, Mohammed is like defining it not as like the rise of fascism, but more the resurgence of fascism. It's there, but at the same time, we're also seeing different, I mean, positive-ish uh, indication of seeing uh, Lula winning <coughs> elections in Brazil, we've got Petro in Colombia. We've, we've seen all those changes that are happening. The idea is just like, how can we capture the moment to make changes to the structures and not the people? And I'm just like reminded, for example, like we recently have a discussion about uh, the results of the elections in Mexico. It's so like, here you are, you have like a climate scientist woman uh, progressive that is leading Mexico, but then when you come to the details of it, it's like given the structure that she is in, nothing much is changing. And I think this is the focus that we have. The good news <laughs> is that, I mean, saying it half sarcastically, that the people who are leading or in the leadership of the powerful uh, nations in the world are mortals. And, uh, and they're not going to stay forever. And, and I'm not jokingly, but there is a regenerational revolution that is happening. And it's happening is like in the same way that it happened in, in the past century, but it's faster. And I think it's just like what we need to focus on is like how can we build solidarity across movements and across, it's happening organically. I mean, like you see like the solidarity movement between 
uh, climate activists and Palestinians, or the feminist movement and what's happening in Palestine. This is really encouraging. However, I mean, we should not be just like waiting for it just to emerge every time there is a crisis or a threat. We need to have our Project 2025 instead of just resisting it. Uh, and I think this is where I get hope from. We need to have our agenda, not just respond to others' agenda. So this is where I get if, it. If I could, I, I'm sorry. I, I forgot just one very clear thing that I meant to say. Um, you know, with the recursion to fascism, I think we need to be honest too, as you said, we need our own plans and we need our own strategies here. And um, I think we should all look at the recursions as an intentional effort to push back on the progress that we've made. And it should be viewed as social regression to, to intentionally under, undermine everything we've worked on. And you know, before Project 2025, there was Campaign of Master Resistance, there was the Southern Manifesto here in the US. These things tried to get at desegregation efforts, uh, integration efforts. Um, so, you know, every decade, if you want to go after this panel and just look at the trail of American history, there's actually every decade an attempt to reintegrate fascism back at the cornerstone that it was at one point of American society. Um, you know, we were almost really close to being fascist, and fascist as a nation after the Civil War, before capitulation happened. And there's always these things that happen every decade. So I just wanted to remember that, you know, maybe there are connections between the 1920s and the 2020s, connections between the 30s and the 1930s. I just wanted to make sure that we're not operating in a bubble here. Things are connected and, again, um, Project 2025 is not new. It's just a reimagined plan, plan for the future that they want to see. So as long as we push back on the future they want to see uh, with our future as it is, and obviously moving forward. I think we're gonna be audiently stronger, but again, fascism doesn't die by just letting it die. You have to actually kill it all. Um, not to promote violence or anything, but um, <laughs> ideologies are, are intentionally rooted in the idea that I alone can fix your problems. And we need to replace the I with we. And as I mentioned at the beginning, there needs to be institutions that are actually built. USCPR, CIP, Afghan, for a better tomorrow, and, and other groups can't do it alone. It's going to take all of us, and again, fascism relies on our group being disconnected, not working together. So hopefully that inspires us to do something, and I'm not really that optimistic, but hopefully what I shared with you was more optimistic than what I'm trying to tell you. But again, I appreciate y'all. Thank you. We're out of time. Um, I am going to ask the speakers to just stay a couple minutes in case anyone wanted to ask any questions. You can come up. But I do want to thank all of you. Thank you to Net Roots for having the space. Thank, to, thank you to all of you for being part of this after lunch in the afternoon. And I want to especially thank our incredible speakers. You all give me hope. The work you continue to lead gives me hope. Um, and I just want to do one last round of applause for all of them. Thank you. Thank you.